Bibles this evening, open them to the book of James, chapter 3. And I just got back from the Stealing the Mind conference. I was supposed to uh, fly back Monday. But my plane, my connecting flight got canceled. So I had to stay there an extra day. But they put me in this beautiful resort, so don't, don't feel sorry for me. And they had me on their credit card. <laughs> So I was living high for 24 hours. But uh, someone's got to suffer for the Lord, right? So why not me? Amen. All right. Thank you, sir. Sure. The Bible says you get a reward for that. If you give a, if you give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, you'll not lose your reward. All right, James chapter 3, we've had a little hiatus, and I was uh, hoping people would show up tonight, because tonight is spring, this week is spring break, right? So we got everything confused, we were supposed to be off tonight, but because of the Chafer Conference, I, I got confused anyway, we didn't get confused, I got confused, right Ann? <laughs> she went. She went like this. That's right. But at any rate, we've had a couple of weeks off, and we were in the, our study of the book of James. So if you could open up to James chapter 3, verse 17. James, um, as you know, is writing a book to um, save people, teaching them how to live righteously. And the first part of the book is really how to live by faith. You know, we're saved by faith, but how do we live on that same principle? Well, the first thing we do is we adopt God's perspective on trials, right? Where we learn to rejoice in the midst of trials. And we learn not to charge God foolishly in the midst of trials, and then the second way to live on faith as a Christian is to obey his word. So that's in the second part of chapter one where we take in his word and we practice it. And this is where we're slow to speech and anger, but quick to listen, particularly to his word. And then we don't just sit, soak, and sour, we practice it. And then from there, we moved into chapter 2, first half of the chapter, where we don't show favoritism in the assembly on the basis of some characteristic that God doesn't divide his church on, such as wealth or something of that nature, you know, giving wealthy people a particular privilege that others don't have. In the church. So that's called favoritism. We don't practice favoritism. And then we allow our faith, which is already inside of us, to manifest itself in good works. And at that point, our faith doesn't come into existence, but our faith becomes useful or productive. And we spend a lot of time there because that's a very misunderstood passage faith without works is dead. That's the second half of chapter two. And then chapter 2 follows very nicely into chapter 3, where James says, here is the ultimate good work you can do as a Christian. In fact, if you can do this, every other good work you do as a Christian is small potatoes, and it's learning to control the tongue. So I'm glad we don't need that chapter, so we can just move right along. We've mastered that one, right? Now that's a tough one. And then you get to chapter 3, verse uh, 13, where now he's really no longer talking about walking by faith. Now he's talking about walking by wisdom. So he's going to do that at the mid midpoint or so of chapter 3, and he's going to keep that train of thought going until the end of the book. So it's hard to walk by wisdom unless we understand what wisdom is. So what he does here in chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, is he defines wisdom. 
Uh, Wisdom, the Greek word Sophia, is always demonstrated by her actions. Verse 13. We saw that last time. So you can tell someone who is wise, not based on what they say, but how they live. Wisdom is always knowledge applied. And now he begins to differentiate. What did I do there? I guess my water was too heavy for my music stand. Uh, So I'll have to put it up here and advertise the water company. We usually don't like to do that, give people free advertising, but maybe we can work out some kind of deal with them. So wisdom is demonstrated by her actions, and, and now he, it's very interesting, he gets into two kinds of wisdom. Because there's a wisdom from above, verses 14 through 16, and there's a wisdom from below, verses 17 through 18. There's earthly wisdom, verses 14 through 16, versus heavenly wisdom, verses 17 and 18. There's wisdom from God, and there's wisdom from Satan. So the wisdom from Satan is a false wisdom. And so we shouldn't, you know, buy into this idea that everything that sounds wise is from God. Um, that's why the, the Proverbs will say things like, there is a way that seems, what, right, but the end thereof is death. So there's a lot of things that look good and look right and look wise, but they're not of God. Uh, I'm reminded of the good old King James Version and its translation of 1 Timothy 6, verse 20, where it talks about knowledge falsely called. And I like the King James because it translates it as science falsely called. So there's a lot of things floating around that look wise, they look philosophical, they even look scientific, but they're not of God. So before James teaches us how to apply wisdom to daily life, he teaches us how to distinguish between the two kinds of wisdom. Wisdom from God versus wisdom from Satan. So verses six, uh, excuse me, 14 through 16, he's dealing with mere human wisdom or earthly wisdom or satanic wisdom. And we saw these verses last time. This is where he says, but if, you, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. For where there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil thing. So what he's done there in these verses is he's described the wrong kind of wisdom. The kind of wisdom that we don't want to embrace as Christians. And since James is the first New Testament book, in other words, you don't have a New Testament at all, and the very first book written is James, he's he's not quoting Paul here because Paul hasn't written anything. Most people believe what James is doing is he's piecing together information from the book of Proverbs. So there's an allusion to a proverb in in all of these pieces or elements of false wisdom. Um, Sometimes it's sort of hard to find the proverb, but this was my best attempt at tracking down which proverb James was referring to. So what is human or earthly wisdom? It's jealous. Proverbs 6, verse 34, it involves selfish ambition. Proverbs 16, verse 18, it's arrogant. Proverbs 8, verse 13, it's earthly or natural. Proverbs 14, verse 12, it's demonic. Proverbs 27, verse 20, and it's contentious. Proverbs 11, verse 29. And I've been involved with a lot of different churches and leadership type groups in churches and I can pretty much walk into any church and I could tell what kind of wisdom is governing that church just by seeing 
the characteristics in that church and do they emulate this kind of thing? Because they might sound very spiritual at first, but when you start seeing these things rear their ugly heads, um, you know that you're dealing with a group of people that aren't being governed by wisdom from above, they're being governed by wisdom from below. So that is the wrong kind of wisdom that we want to reject as God's people. So with that being said, what is the right kind of wisdom? And this is now new information and we pick it up here with fresh material, verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom from above, so now he's giving us the right kind of wisdom in contrast to the wrong kind of wisdom that we saw earlier. But wisdom, but the wisdom, that's why there's a contrast here, but he's contrasting heavenly wisdom versus the prior described earthly wisdom. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, then reasonable, then full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So what then is the wisdom from above or the wisdom of God? Like the wisdom from below, there's a proverb that goes with each one of these elements. So God's wisdom is first of all uh, pure. And I would pick the proverb that he's alluding to. I would pick Proverbs 15 verse 26. Which says, evil plans are an abomination to the Lord, but pleasant words are pure. So God is looking for purity, not just in actions, but in motives. And from there, he talks about another element of God's wisdom. It's peaceable. He says it's first pure, then peaceable, and then you go down to verse 18, and it mentions peace twice. Um, it's the Greek word Irene, where you get the name uh, Irene from. And I think he's probably alluding there to Proverbs 3, verses 1 and 2, which says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but have your heart comply with my commandments, for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. So it's not surprising that God's wisdom involves peace since Jesus is the, Isaiah 9 verse 6, it's on all your Christmas cards, the Prince of Peace. So there are a lot of people out there that are um, extremely argumentative and almost every conversation they get into it involves some kind of scuffle or borderline food fight I mean you see this kind of thing going on in churches you see that going on on social media and the people that act this way claim to be Christians and so you wonder what kind of wisdom are we dealing with here because if it were Jesus involved there would be more of an irenic uh, peaceful sort of mindset a verse that I thought of uh, related to peace is Ephesians 2, verse 14, which is the same word peace, Irene. It says, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. So if the Lord is about anything, he's about peace. He's called the Prince of Peace. He gives us peace with God. Uh, he gives us peace in the heart. And he takes groups that formerly were at war with each other, like Jews and Gentiles. And according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, he brings them into harmony with each other. I mean, that's the work of Jesus. And so as we walk out his wisdom, we're going to find ourselves to be uh, peaceful, ironic uh, sorts. You know, we're following uh, Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, which says, blessed are the peacemakers. It doesn't say blessed are the ones who are able to win every single argument. 
and always get their way. Um, blessed are the peacemakers. And so that's another element of wisdom from above. Very different than Satan's wisdom, which is contentiousness, as we saw earlier. And then he gives us a, a third element of God's wisdom, and it has to do with gentleness. It says, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, and then gentle. And I would pick as a proverb, Proverbs 16, verse 32, which says, one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and one who rules his spirit is better than one who captures a city. Uh, that's what you call um, synonymous Hebrew parallelism there in Proverbs 16, verse 32, where the second line repeats what's in the first line, but in different words. And so the two lines rhyme in that sense. But if you're, you know, you're in a situation where you're, people are provoking you, maybe someone's cutting you off on the freeway, or maybe you're not getting a fair shake at work, or someone is slandering you, and rather than retaliating, which is very easy for all of us to do, you allow the Lord to subdue your spirit, and you bear up under those unfair circumstances, well, the Bible says you're just as mighty as a warrior, and you're just as mighty as one who captures a whole city. I mean, if you can control your own spirit in that sense, then you're just as powerful as one who can take over or subdue an entire city. So that may be what he's referring to there when he talks about uh, gentleness. You remember earlier in James chapter 3, verse 13, when he was talking about wisdom in general, he talks about the gentleness of wisdom. So, you know, the guy that's loudest in the room is not necessarily the wisest. The, the one who has the sharpest wit and is able to defeat all of his opponents in an argument is not necessarily the wisest. Uh, according to the Bible, the wisest is the person that operates in the spirit of gentleness. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about self-defense issues and things like that. I'm just talking about personal wrongs. And the Lord, with the resources that he's given to us, wants us to walk in gentleness in the midst of those circumstances. Kind of like Jesus when he hung there on the cross. Remember his, some of his last words? What did Jesus say is his final words? He says, it is finished. But before that, he says, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. He didn't, let, he didn't hang there on the cross and say, you guys just wait till the second coming because I'm going to beat every one of you down. You just wait and see. I mean, which would be the human thing that, that we would do if we were treated that way. But Jesus says, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. I mean, that's the gentleness of wisdom that James the half-brother of Christ, is speaking of. And then another element, I think this is my fourth element of uh, divine wisdom, is reasonableness. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, and then reasonable. And I would pick as a Proverbs, a proverb undergirding that, Proverbs 14 verse 15 which says the naive believes everything but the simple person considers his steps so we're called to be like the brains were with Paul we're not called to be so open-minded that our brains leak out of our heads um, we're called to be people of judgment in the sense that we're always discerning things is this idea consistent with God's word or inconsistent with it, and we reject things that are inconsistent with God's word. So worship is actually mentally active. Uh, God never calls the Christian to check their brain when they go into the church. 
Um, everything that you hear anywhere, including in a church, should be screened through God's word that you already know of to see if these things are so. That's what the Bereans did with Paul in Acts 17, verse 11. It says, the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians, um, for they received the, the word from Paul with great eagerness. They weren't closed-minded. But they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And Paul didn't say, how dare you challenge me? He was open to being challenged uh, because he wanted his ministry to em emulate God's word. And, you know, they weren't, um, you know, provoking Paul or trying to irritate Paul. They received his teaching with eagerness, but they just wanted to look at the scriptures to see if these things were so. And they did this daily, it says, in Acts 17, verse 11. And that's what made them more noble than the Thessalonians, who didn't put this into practice. So I think that's what he's getting at when he talks here about being reasonable. And then he talks about number five, full of, and there's the slide I was supposed to have up. That was supposed to be Proverbs 14, verse 15. And then he talks about full of mercy and good fruits, the mercy part of it, I think, can be found in Proverbs 11, verse 7, which says, a merciful, excuse me, thank you, you're going to be a good Berean, whoever said that. They didn't say 7, they said 17, so thank you. How, how dare you challenge me? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> A, a merciful person does himself good, but the, pruel, the cruel person does himself harm. So we think if we're gracious to people or merciful to people that somehow we're, we're getting behind because we've got to look out for number one. What the Bible actually teaches, the more gracious and merciful you are to people, the more you water yourself. I think it's Proverbs, I want to say around chapter 11, Verses 24 and 25, it says, He who waters others, himself will be watered. And that's what that proverb is saying. A merciful person does himself good, but the cruel person does himself harm. So that's what he means by full of mercy. What does he mean by good fruits? He may have his eye on Proverbs 3, verse 18 which says, she, concerning wisdom, she is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are those who hold on to her. So a lot of times in the Bible, you'll see wisdom analogized to a tree bearing good fruit. And uh, that's how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be like a tree. In fact, Psalm 1 tells us that. We're to be like a, a tree that, and you see imagery going back into the upper room with the vine and the branches where we're just called upon to draw from the nurturing sap of the vine and we as the branches connected to the vine bear fruit automatically. So one of the things Dennis Roxer said when he was here, I believe he said it when he was at our church or maybe he said it at Chafer one of the two, but he said the Christian is not called to produce fruit. Did anybody hear him say that? Okay, well, someone said yes? Did he say that? Oh, you don't know, okay. <laughs> you're just trying to rescue me because you're a person full of, you're a person full of mercy and good fruits. But either he said it here or at Schaefer or maybe somewhere else. And when I heard him first heard him say it, it was sort of revolutionary. He said a Christian is not called to uh, produce fruit. A Christian is called to bear fruit. And when you study John 15, Jesus never says get out there and produce fruit. What he says is bear fruit. And there's a big difference between producing fruit and bearing fruit. Amen. Producing fruit is the branch seeks to do it in his own power or her own power. Bearing fruit means the branch just stays connected to the vine by way of fellowship. In this case, Jesus Christ, and the fruit comes sort of spontaneously or naturally without even 
uh, exerting much effort. And then it becomes not your fruit, but his fruit, which will last where your fruit won't. And so you start to understand that and it changes Christianity for you because now you see your job is just to be around Jesus. Uh, If Jesus is the focus of your life, then whatever fruit you're supposed to bear will happen. If going out and producing fruit is the focus of your life, then what's going to happen is Jesus is going to get left out of the equation And the fruit that you produce is going to be mustered up through the flesh or self-discipline. And it won't last. So that's why wisdom here is analogized quite frequently to good fruits. So we can have mercy on people when we're around Jesus who is is the king of mercy. Uh, If you're telling me to exercise mercy in my own power, I don't really think I have the ability to do that. But as I find myself around Christ and I see his mercy towards people to the point where he hung out with the prostitutes and the tax gatherers who were the scum of the earth, that's how merciful he was. If he becomes your role model, then exercising mercy towards others actually can become uh, easier or easy and enjoyable because it's not you doing it. It's Jesus through you. And then another um, element of wisdom from above is being unwavering. And I was really hoping and praying we would get to this today because this is the in and out burger proverb. You guys ever eat an in and out burger? Those of you that don't have your hands up are lying. <laughs> they just, they have a new one here in Houston. You guys knew that, right? That was like the New Jerusalem when that came. (laughs) But um, it's kind of cool when you look at their cup. um, Inside it says John 3.16. And then you order some fries and you look at the bottom. It'll say Proverbs 24 verse 16. So as your spiritual exercise tonight, you need to go to In-N-Out Burger to see if these things are so. So I got really interested in Proverbs 24, verse 16. What does that even say? Because that's like the French fry verse. It says, for a righteous person falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of disaster. And I think that's what he's talking about when he says unwavering. So I don't know if it was Abraham Lincoln or somebody famous said, it's not the fact that you get knocked down that's the issue. The issue is after you get knocked down, because everybody gets knocked down, it's how fast can you get back up. That's the issue. So what you'll find as you walk with the Lord is you have a resilience. Uh, You're not as thrown off your game as you are when you're not walking with Jesus because you have this sort of reservoir of unwaveringness about you. And then finally, number seven, actually not finally, but almost finally. Oh, Proverbs 24, verse 16, that was supposed to be up as I was talking. Uh, Finally, is without hypocrisy, the wisdom from God is without hypocrisy. Now, what is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is basically a double, a double life, which all of us as Christians are capable of. Because have you noticed that your sin nature didn't just disappear when you got saved? Am I talking to the right crowd here? You guys look very spiritual with your Bibles and taking notes, but you have a sin nature still as a Christian. Now, you have a new nature, but you still have a sin nature. And you have the ability, we have the ability to overcome the old nature that we didn't have before because we have resources inside of us that didn't exist before. So you have the ability to tell the sin nature no. Whereas prior to your conversion to Christianity, you had no ability to tell your sin nature no. You were a slave to it. So the sin nature is always going to be there to go back to if I choose to as a Christian. 
So therefore, the Christian is completely capable of a double life. Uh, I am completely capable of looking one way on Sunday and acting in a totally different way on Monday. In fact, when you run into people like that that are at your church, this hap- happened to me in a, in a work situation in um, California. I ran into a guy that I went to church with, and you know he was out of his church environment. And man, the profanity flowed <laughs> like you wouldn't believe out of this guy. And I'm thinking to myself, is this the same guy that I was with at church singing praises unto the Lord? And it's sort of eye-opening when you see that in somebody. And then the Lord says, well, that's what you're like too. You have that same ability to go right back to the sin nature. And I saw that in that person and I said, Lord, I just don't want to be that way. You know, whatever you have to do to change me or get me in line so I, so I don't have this double life. You know, please help me with that. And that's the wisdom from above. That's without wisdom without hypocrisy. So I would pick as a proverb that he's probably referring to here is Proverbs 28, verse 13, which says, The one who conceals his wrongdoing will not prosper. But one who confesses and abandons them will find compassion. So as long as we're living this double life and we're just sort of pretending to be one thing in public and we're different in private, or we act one way on Sunday and a different way on Monday, Proverbs says you will not prosper as long as you're doing that. And the ability to do it still exists in us. The ability to do that will exist until the day you die or until the rapture, whichever comes first. Um, As long as you're in this body and not in a state of glorification, the old nature is there to return to. And a lot of Christians do that and I don't know what we think. We think God doesn't see or we think we're getting ahead or something. But Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, the person that does that will not prosper. So that is kind of a bird's eye view of wisdom from above. Wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits. Unwavering. They eat at In-N-Out Burger a lot. That's a spiritual thing to do. And they're without hypocrisy. And that's very different than the wisdom from below, which we saw earlier. So now what James has done is he's defined wisdom because he's changing subjects. He's no longer talking about the walk of faith, but he's talking about wisdom And so wisdom is demonstrated by her actions, verse 13. Here is false wisdom, verses 14 through 16, in contrast to the true wisdom, verses 17 and 18. So now what James does is he takes that wisdom that he has defined for us and he begins to apply it to every area of life. And that's how the book ends by application of wisdom because that's really what wisdom is right wisdom is always application it's not knowledge gnosis it's sophia what's the difference between gnosis and sophia it's knowledge applied that's wisdom it's what in the book of proverbs is called hokama or taking knowledge and applying it. So spiritual growth and spiritual maturity is not measured by how much data you know. That's one of the mistakes that is made a lot of times in circles like our own that are very strong on Bible teaching. Uh, You know, people will take notes and um, they'll have a whole, you know, electronic catalog of things that they learned and their Bible will be all marked up. And all that is fantastic, by the way, but God never designed that as the last step. God designed that as the first step. 
once you learn all that stuff, then the Holy Spirit says, okay, it's time to live it out. And as you start making daily, moment-by-moment decisions based on the things you learned, you're no longer just walking in knowledge, you're walking in wisdom. You're not just walking in gnosis, you're walking in Sophia or Hokama. And the knowledge that you're learning applies to every area of life. So 1 James applies it to spirituality. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Then he applies it to business decisions. Chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Then he applies it to the use of wealth. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. See, if someone is claiming to be wise, I would say, well, can I look at your checkbook? Because how we use money as chapter 4 13 through 17, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, is evidence of whether we're walking in wisdom or not. He applies it to waiting for the Lord's return, chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. He applies it to prayer, chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. And then he applies it to restoring the erring brother. So if someone has wandered off the path, How do you restore that person? Jesus analogized it to taking a splinter out of somebody's eye in Matthew 7. Think about how delicate of an operation that is. And surgical precision necessary to take a splinter out of someone's eye. That's the wisdom that's necessary to take a wayward spouse, uh, a wayward child, child, grandchild, a wayward church member, a wayward friend, and turn them back to the things of God. You get involved in that, you're going to need some real wisdom. And that's why James concludes his book with dealing with the restoration of the erring brother. So that's the direction the book is moving in. So let's see if we can get a little, little ways here into the first thing James talks about, our spiritual life. Uh, We know what wisdom is, now how do we apply it to spiritual life? James says you have to avoid two things. Avoid wrangling, verses 1 through 3. Avoid worldliness, verses 4 through 6. And one of the things I love about the Bible is it's not a book of don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. What the Bible does is it says, okay, don't do this, but allow God to replace that activity with something better. The Bible's not a no book, it's a better book. So yeah, he's, he tells us to avoid wrangling, avoid worldliness, but then he says, instead of that stuff, here's something better that you could pursue in its place. And that's the essence of spiritual wisdom. Chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. And I don't know if we do a very good job communicating that to the world. Because the world looks at Christians that say, don't be a homosexual. Don't get an abortion. Don't look at pornography. You know, don't do this, don't do that, as if we're just a bunch of don't, don't, don'ts. That's not Christianity. Christianity is, yeah, those things are evil and you should stay away from them. But God has something so much better for you than the pursuit of those empty things. So he tells us what to pursue in those last verses, chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. So starting with the first one here uh, that we should avoid, we should avoid wrangling. So he describes the problem, verse 1. Then he describes the source of the problem. So what is the problem that James has his finger on? You'll see it there in chapter 4, verses, verse 1. He says, what is the source of quarrels, quarrels excuse me, and conflicts among you? What is he telling us to avoid here? Avoid wrangling. You'll notice what it says here, among you. So he's talking about conflicts among Christians. 
And it's like, gee, James, I wish you'd talk about something more relevant. I'm being facetious there because it's very relevant. Christians get out of sorts with each other constantly. And James says, as, as, as long as it's within your power to do that, you should avoid that. And as you probably know, most church splits and churches split all the time. It really, when you study church splits, and I was in a, a Presbyterian pastor's office And he had a chart where he had every church split in his denomination going back to the Civil War. You know, this group split from this group. From this group, they split from that group. And literally, it was like a, it was looking at that chart, it was like a maze. I've never seen anything like that. But it just shows you how fast churches split and how fast Christians get upset with each other. And the sad thing about it is when church splits happen, nine, I would say this, over 90% of the time, it has nothing to do with some great doctrinal issue. I mean, you would think it would be uh, the, you know, the virgin birth or the deity of Christ. Sometimes that is the issue, but that typically is not the issue. A lot of times things like that are used as the issue. But the issue is not the issue. The issue is the attitude as far as God is concerned. And so generally when church splits happen, it has to do with personality things. You know, sister so-and-so gets more time on the piano than I get. And I don't like the pastor because he didn't allow me to start this ministry. Or, you know, it's the silliest of things. I mean, things related to the uh, color of the carpet. So be honest with you, us elders were really nervous when we were putting in new carpet, you know. It's like, good grief, are we going to start a war here or what? But, you know, that's, that's just human nature. People are like that. They, they get mad. This pastor parts his hair on the wrong side of the head. So I'm going to go down the street and I'm going to find a pastor that combs his hair uh, the way I think it should be combed, assuming the pastor has hair to comb which sometimes is not the case. So James basically is saying, avoid those kinds of things. He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Now what James does is he tells us where those things come from. Why is it that Christians have such a difficult time getting along with each other? What is the root of the problem? And James' analysis here is completely and totally different than secular psychology. Because a secular psychologist or even a Christian drawing from secular psychology. At this point, we'll start going on and on about temperaments. Have you guys seen teaching on temperaments? There's, you know, different personality types different temperaments, Um, they've got animal names for each of them. And so a lot of churches will get you embroiled in these sort of temperament tests or personality tests. And the name of the game is to get the right personality types working together. And on a staff, a church staff, you've got to get the right personality types working with each other. And the, the idea is if we get all that figured out from a personality type temperament level, then conflicts within the church will cease. Now, when people analyze it from that standpoint, they're not analyzing it from the lens of God's word. They're analyzing it from what secular psychology has to offer. You notice James here doesn't even talk about personality types or temperaments. He gets into a source He tells you where the source of these things are, these conflicts that have nothing to do with the findings of modern day psychology. So James, where do these things come from? These conflicts arise because of our hearts. You look at the second part of verse one into verse two. He says, is not the source In other words, the conflicts that he's just talked about, now he's giving us the source of where these things come from. Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? 
Now in the Bible, you'll see members is a reference many times to the body. And then in verse 2, first part of verse 2, he says, you lust. Now what is lust? It's desiring what God has forbidden. That's what lust is. You lust, you know, and we think of it sexually many times, but it doesn't have to just relate to that. You know, you could desire someone else's talent that God didn't give you. You could desire someone else's prestige. You can desire someone else's reputation. And James says that really is the source of conflicts amongst Christians. He says, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. So where in the world do all of these conflicts amongst Christians come from? It comes from the heart, which is sinful. And it comes from sinful desires and Christians moving into lust. And rather than surrendering it to the Lord and saying, well, you know, I I really wish I was as good a singer as so-and-so, but Lord, you didn't make me a singer. So rather than being jealous of the person, and then when you're jealous of the person, you start to kind of take shots at them, you know, behind their back and things like that. Rather than being jealous of them, Lord, help me to overcome my jealousy and help me to be who you want me to be rather than who I lustfully desire to be. But we don't do that. We don't take it to the Lord. We move off into envy. We move off into jealousy. We we start taking shots at people behind their back. And that's, James is saying, that's where these conflicts come from. So one of the things to understand about the Bible is the Bible teaches that the human heart is wicked. Um, I don't, I never had to sit my daughter down. Well, let's not pick on my daughter. My parents never had to sit me down and say, okay, we're going to teach you how to be selfish today. Ready? Uh, Oh, by the way, when you don't get your way, we're going to teach you today how to throw a tantrum. This is how you do it. So all of those things being selfish, you know, hoarding my toys and not sharing them with my friends. I never had to be taught any of that. Um, In fact, I had to be taught by my parents the opposite. How to control my anger, how to control selfishness, how to be a giver rather than a taker. Why? Because I'm selfish by nature. And that's what James is saying here. That's where the conflicts among Christians Most of them, that's where they come from. So Jesus made the same point. He says this, he was saying that which proceeds out of the man is that which defiles the man. In other words, they were criticizing him here because he allowed his disciples to eat on the Sabbath. What a terrible thing. And that he was acting like he was involved in some kind of unspiritual you know, enterprise. And Jesus here makes a tremendous anthropological point, meaning a point related to the doctrine of man. He says it's not what man takes in that corrupts him. It's not eating on the Sabbath that's the problem. It's what spills out of his heart, which is wicked in original sin. He was saying that which proceeds out of the man, that which, that is what defiles the man from within. See that? Out of the hearts of men proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders. Now didn't James here say you commit murder? Was his audience physically committing murder? No, you can commit murder as a Christian by simply hating somebody. According to the teachings on the Sermon on the Mount. Well, why would I hate somebody? Because they're better at something than I am. Or they're more talented than I am. Or they live in a nicer area than I live in. Or they drive a better car than I drive. And so I'm jealous. And so rather than going to the Lord and saying, Lord, help me with my jealousy, we start to, you know, attack each other. Um, 
For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, oh, that's a big one, slander, that's what James is talking about here, Christians slandering each other, pride, foolishness, and as if all of that's not clear enough, verse 23, Jesus circles back to his main point, all these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Paul the Apostle in the book of Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21 is going to make the same point. Paul is going to call these things the works of the flesh. These are the ways that the sin nature manifests itself in observable ways. And you always know as a Christian that you're moving off into the sin nature when these things become habitual in our lives. Paul says, now the deeds of the flesh, that's the sin nature, the Greek is the sarx, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostilities, look at this, hostilities, strife, jealousy, and outbursts of anger. Uh, hostilities, strife, jealousy, those are relational sins. That's what James is dealing with. Christians arguing and contending with each other. Where does it come from? It, it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that you're working with the wrong personality type. It has everything to do with the sin nature, which is not in subjection. You're allowing it to reign. Selfish ambition dissensions, factions, envying, <laughs> uh, carous uh, carousing, drunkenness, and it's almost like Paul gets tired of mentioning things. You know, he says, I can go on and on, but he says, and things like this. In other words, I could go on and on giving other manifestations of the flesh, but you get my point. And things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those... Now, see the shift from you to those? You see how he just went from second person to third person? When he talks about those, he's talking about unbelievers. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I bring this up because many people will use a passage like this to teach the insecurity of salvation. If you move off into these things, then you're not going to heaven. But that's resolved when you see the shift in pronouns from second to the third person. From you to those. And Paul's point is you as a Christian have the potential to act just like an unbeliever. Through these works of the flesh. This is what unbelievers are like all of the time. And since you as a Christian are dual natured. You have the propensity to go right back to the flesh and act just like an unbeliever. And Paul's point is, why would you do that? That's not who you are. That's not your identity. It's not your destiny. Why would, why would you act like an unbeliever when the unbeliever, those, are going to a completely different destiny than what you're going to? And that's why he mentions those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But notice these works of the flesh come from within. Why is that? Because the human heart is corrupted and wicked. That's why Genesis 8.21 says, the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And Marilyn, I think I heard you a couple minutes ago quote Jeremiah 17 verse 9, right? There it is. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? It is very interesting to me that when you get saved, God makes no attempt to reform the old nature. He doesn't slap a coat of fresh paint over the old nature. Why doesn't he do that? Because the old nature is unredeemable. It's unfixable. 
putting uh, lipstick on a pig is still a pig, right? What God does is he gives you a new, what? Nature. And you become dual natured now with the ability to please the new nature. You have new desires. And the goal of your Christian life from that point on is to live according to the desires of the new nature and to reckon dead logizomai, where we get the word logic, which is an accounting term, logizomai, reckon dead the deeds of the flesh. In other words, you do not have to go back to the flesh as a Christian because the deeds of the flesh have been crucified. The desire to return to the old nature is there and will always be there, but you can do what Nancy Reagan said, just say no. Now, before you were saved, you could not just say no. You were a slave to it. But now that you have new resources inside of you, you have the capacity to just say no. And why would I want to go back to that old nature? Look what it is. It's deceitful. It's sick. Who can even understand it? You know, when God sizes up humanity, this is God's assessment. Because we're corrupted by that old nature. We're deceitful by nature. We're sick. And we don't even understand how wicked we are a lot of the time. And by the way, you inherited that old nature from the point of conception. Psalm 51 and verse 5, David says, Behold, I was brought forth in guilt, and in sin my mother conceived me. In other words, at the point when life begins, which is conception... What is transferred to every single human being is a nature that's at war with their creator. And God never tries to correct that old nature in the sense that he tries to fix it or rehabilitate it. I mean, not even God, think about that. God is all powerful and not even God tries to fix it. What God does is he gives you a brand new nature. And that happens not at the point of physical conception, but that happens at the point of spiritual birth. The moment you trust in Christ as your Savior, boom, you're born spiritually. And you have a new nature. And now you have to be taught the principles of discipleship. And part of those principles involve reckoning logizomai considering dead, Romans 6, that old nature, and live according to the desires of the new nature. So you walk into a church where there's bickering and conflict and hostility and antagonism and all of the secular psychologists want to use that situation to showcase their personality profiles and inventories. James says the reason that church is in that condition is you've got a lot of believers in that church that aren't living according to the desires of the new nature. They went right back to the old desires of the old nature and they got involved in the relational sins. Jealousy, envy, outbursts of anger, desiring something that someone else has, you move into envy at that point and you don't get what it is you think you deserve and so you start to slander people behind their back. And usually, you know, it comes across as spiritual a little bit. You know, you might dress it up in a little bit of spiritual language, but it's just because you throw a Bible verse in here or there, <laughs> it, it could still be from the corrupted old nature. And that becomes the source of conflicts. And this is why we are to avoid wrangling. So rather than being envious of something that someone else has within the church and moving into relational sins, what instead should I do? I ought to take that situation to the Lord in prayer. He's going to talk about that in the second half of verse 2. 
And I, James at that point says, you have not because you ask not. I mean, maybe it is that you don't have the status or the wealth or the talent that someone else has because you never took time to ask God for those things. Could be, right? But verse 3, he says, be careful because when you ask God in prayer, make sure you're asking with the right reasons. Don't ask God to bless you so you can win a popularity contest. You want to be blessed by God so you can be a blessing to other people. And he's going to deal with that in verse 3. So, we're going to stop right on time tonight. Someone take a picture of the clock because that never happens. So, uh, if you've got to pick up your kids or otherwise take off, now's would be, now would be a good time. And we'll pick it up with verse 2 next time. And if anybody has any comments.